guys, Prowl1701 here. My question today is, do you think <coughs> the Ninth Doctor is considered underrated? Not necessarily whether you think he is a, uh, underrated or not yourself, but what, do you think he has a reputation as being underrated? Because I remember when I did my video talking about uh, which doctors do you feel were most like underrated in their era? Or when they were the doctor. I know a lot of people kept bringing up Eccleston, which I hadn't talked about Eccleston. And it's interesting for me because I don't feel like Eccleston is necessarily underrated. People seem to like Eccleston. I don't hear too many bad things about the Ninth Doctor and his portrayal of the Ninth Doctor. Everybody seems to think he was a good doctor in a good series. What I think happens more with Eccleston is I feel he's overshadowed, especially by Tennant. Because Eccleston only stayed that one series and then Tennant came in right after him and Tennant's popularity just took off, the show started getting really popular, um, even becoming kind of mainstream here in America uh, for a time, but basically during the Tennant and Matt Smith era, that I sometimes feel like people forget about Eccleston because they were talking about Smith and Tennant and I still think most of the talk, at least positive talk, is about Tennant, Smith, and Capaldi. You really see, especially these days, Capaldi and Tennant getting a lot of attention. And I feel like Eccleston is just kind of forgotten in the sense that he's overshadowed. I don't think he's underrated. If you bring up someone, if you bring up Eccleston with a fellow member, they'll start talking about Eccleston. Now, they probably like Eccleston. They just tend to, he tends to get lost in the conversation because he only did that one series. He wasn't there long. You know, with Eccleston, when you if you first start, especially if you're starting Doctor Who for the first time with Eccleston, which a lot of people did, that was a lot of people's first Doctor, he's kind of there and he's gone. You have just enough time to get used to him being the Doctor before he regenerates into Tenant. And of course, you know, a fan goes through that confusion of, wait, what, what just happened? You know, if they're not aware of regeneration and all of that. and But then once they get used to Tenant, and Tenant being such a huge Doctor, they kind of get to where they connect with Tennant. Tennant's the first Doctor modern audiences or an audience of the modern show. I'm starting to think those are different things. Um, really had a chance to connect with long term. They really had a chance to grow with, to grow up with. You know, a lot of people who grew up with Tennant from, say, 2005 to 2009, 2010, right there at the beginning of 2010. You know, some people aged in some of their formidable years, they went from being, you know, six to being nine or 10, from being you know, nine to being 13, 14. You know, they had that little gap there where you grow and change a lot. So you, they really had a chance to connect with a doctor for the first time where Tenet's regeneration hit them a lot harder. It was very emotional for a lot of people when he regenerated at the end of time. With Eccleston, he just wasn't there long. You didn't have enough time to really grow with his doctor because he was just kind of gone. So I feel like he's just kind of overshadowed. And I think one of the reasons Eccleston maintains his popularity when he comes up in the conversation is, one, just Christopher Eccleston's good as the Ninth Doctor. I love his characterization of the Ninth Doctor. I love how he has his humorous moments and his uh, silly moments, but he also has his very serious, deadly, don't screw with this person moments, and how he can flip back and forth between them on a dime. I love that. But also, Series 1 is just a strong series for the most part. It is a very solid series. I argue sometimes that it's my second favorite of Modern Who. Interestingly enough, I don't quite hold it in the esteem I used to. Um, I used to argue it had no bad stories. And I still don't think it necessarily has any objectively bad stories. But I have noticed within the past year or so that I'm less enamored with some of them that I don't want to go back and rewatch some of them. Now, to be fair, the Russell T. Davis one era, I watched a lot. Like, because I really, really loved this era back when it came out. So I watched uh, the the Russell T. Davis one, series one through four, really one through five, including uh, Matt Smith's first season with um, Stephen Moffat. I watched those a lot. I mean, from the late 2000s or the mid to late 2000s through the 2010s to about 2015 or so, I watch these a lot. So I've seen all of Eccleston's episodes several times, uh, with the exception of Unquiet Dead, where I've only watched about three times because I, I have issues with that one. Just, it, it unnerves the heck out of me. Um, 
But there are a couple episodes that I have noticed I don't ever feel myself wanting to rewatch. The World War III two-parter with the Slitheine. Uh, just for some reason, that one doesn't do much. I don't think it's objectively bad by any means, but I don't really have the desire to watch it. Father's Day is another one, which I know is actually one Eccleston himself is very fond of. He's talked before about that being his favorite story sometimes. Uh, he really likes Father's Day. I don't really get into Father's Day. I don't know why. The performances are good. The guy playing Rose's father is good. Uh, the CGI effects of the bad creatures have aged terribly. Like... Early modern Doctor Who has aged so bad. It's kind of funny how back in the day people would tell me they could only watch modern Who back when the Russell T. Davis one era was kind of in its prime. We can only watch, they'd tell me they could only watch the modern series because the effects were better and that classic Who had the cheap effects. It's kind of funny now in 2024 that the effects from the Russell T. Day, the Russell T. Davis one era kind of look bad in places like they haven't aged gracefully and i've talked before on the channel about how practical effects looking dated don't bother me as much most of the time i mean there are some naft effects in classic Who for sure but most of the time it doesn't bother me because i know it was a cheap low budget show it doesn't really bother me but bad cgi i have a much harder problem with like you know mortal kombat annihilation Ooh. Uh, yeah, I have problems with some of that bad, ropey, direct-to-DVD-looking 2000s CGI. <laughs> you kind of lose me. So the bat creatures look rough. And then just the story doesn't really do much for me. I just, I don't get into Father's Day the way some people do. Also, um, Bad Wolf, which is, of course, part one of the finale, I don't really get into as much anymore. The dated game show references really... Irk me. I never really cared for the game show references to begin with because I don't really get into reality TV. I don't think taking something like 1984 and making a reality show out of it, Big Brother, I don't think that's quite what Orwell had in mind. So I have a little problem with um, part one. It's still perfectly watchable. And if I'm going to watch the finale, I watch part one and part two. But part one grates me, whereas I love part two. For some reason, those don't quite live up for me. Now, I still love some of them like The Long Game. I know a lot of people call The Long Game the weakest one of series one. And I've done several videos where I've defended The Long Game because I do like several things about it. Uh, I like the fact that it kind of shows what happens when the Doctor doesn't clean up his mess or it sets up the Doctor not cleaning up his mess in the series finale, which ultimately leads him to have to regenerate because he doesn't stick around and clean up his mess. Also, it shows that the Doctor... It shows that not everyone is cut out to be a companion for the Doctor, and keeping in mind that the Doctor doesn't choose Adam, Rose chooses Adam, and not everyone is cut out to be a companion for the Doctor, and that the Doctor is pretty intelligent in the people he chooses to be his companion. So I like that, too. I like seeing a failed companion. Plus, I love the ending when he traps him there with the little thing in his head and doesn't fix it. I, I like that. Eccleston could be dark when he wants to. And then most of the rest of the season I like. I like Rose. I enjoy End of the World. I'm quite dead. Again, I don't think it's bad. I just can't really watch it. Uh, Dalek is fantastic. The Silence in the Library. Not Silence in the Library. The Empty Child two-parter is really good. And I even love Boomtown a lot. I think Boomtown is really, really good. It's a lot, it's really funny, actually. And I like the act, the actress, the, the, the Slovene actress. I like her a lot. I really do. She's so good. It's almost like she's kind of hamming it up at times, but it's perfect. It's like, uh, uh, like chasing the seeds of doom. It's just that perfect level. So more than anything, uh, I got off on a bit of a tangent there, but more than anything, I don't think that Eccleston is considered underrated so much as I feel he is sometimes overshadowed by Tennant, Smith, and Capaldi, more just because I think their doctors and their names come to people's mind more freely when talking about modern Doctor Who, because Eccleston was just kind of there for that one season. So once you bring Eccleston up in a conversation, I think he's good. I think people, oh yeah, Eccleston, and they'll start talking about it. Whereas, you know, if you don't bring him up, people might, you know, be sitting there talking about Capaldi or Tennant or Smith and all of that. that That's my thoughts. Not underrated, just a little overshadowed to where people don't instinctively think of him. So I want to know what you think of this video and my thoughts on that. Do you think he's underrated? Do you think he's uh, overshadowed sometimes, perhaps, by the others? 
I want to know your thoughts. Comment down below and let's talk about it. Don't forget to click the like button and the subscribe button as well. I also have a Patreon if you would like to support me on that. That is certainly appreciated. I uh, want to give a shout out to a couple of my top tier patrons, Colin Coney and Sam Vinning. I appreciate their support as I do the support of all of my patrons. It's very much appreciated. I also want to give a shout out. Um, oh, sorry, my mind went blank. <laughs> I want to give a shout out to my YouTube members as well because I do very much appreciate their continued support as I do the support of all of my YouTube members, patrons, and all of that. I also have a P.O. box if there's anything you'd like to send me to look at and review. How I got most of these collection sets here, the standard ones. Simon's been really nice about sending those. Uh, and I also have links to my Amazon wish list and Amazon UK wish list down there as well. Most importantly, thank you for watching.